Is it weird to say that Shovel Knight elevates the medium? The surprise hit of 2014 does a lot of things right, and I want to discuss what some of those things are, and more importantly, I want to see what we can learn from it going forwards. We're about to ride on the magical train of game design, but be warned. Analyses are always biased, I cannot share any collective opinions on a game, so instead, I want to make sure you know where my biases are coming from. This series I'm doing is focused on learning. I want to find something that these games can teach us, but I also want to present and critique them as what they are. Shovel Knight aims to capture nostalgia, so I'm gonna judge it on those merits, instead of bringing any personal expectations to the table. Having said that, presenting is perceiving, and perception is always personal. A quick vocabulary lesson. Nostalgia is a term for a sentimental feeling of the past. The reason people feel nostalgia is because memories are formed by emotion, and the further away something is, the stronger the emotions tied to it. A distant event is very easy to filter so that only the good parts stand out. The reason the old days were quote-unquote good and the future is quote-unquote bad is because we only have emotions tied to one of them. Looking at things in a pragmatic sense, there is no objective difference between them other than what we project, but we project them whether we're aware of the chemistry behind it or not, so nostalgia is present in everyone. Since nostalgia is such a universal feeling, it is a dangerous tightrope to walk in terms of trying to please people, but the good people at Yacht Club Games set the goal high, so delivering was gonna take a lot of ingenuity in game design, which luckily served the game well. Shovel Knight has a very fun attitude towards itself. It doesn't think it's overly serious, on the contrary, it's quite genial and has a good time poking fun of itself. Setting a tone is done in the opening moments. Shovel Knight's are a quick Yacht Club Games jingle, an upbeat menu and an opening cutscene. The cutscene establishes the world, the motivation, and sets of things to come. It also sets up the characters, but I'll get more into them later. After the cutscene, we enter the tutorial level and BAM! The music style for Mega Man. And that's not just flattery on my part. They got the actual sound designer from Mega Man to compose some of the score, and luckily for us, she hasn't lost her touch. If the first minute of Shovel Knight hasn't struck some nostalgic nerve yet, then the game probably won't. But there is another thing to note about the tone that everyone can enjoy, nostalgic or not, and that's the game's use of camp. The game has a campy tone, and if you know me, you're aware I love me some camp. For those unfamiliar with that term, camp is the design style of deliberate theatricality. It is a style that often uses old-school and outdated tropes to hammer home a message, and that fits well into Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight is very over-the-top and self-aware, and since it's already using old tropes, why not go with a campy style? That way, the game's tone can be used to enhance the game's narrative and overall presentation, which is great. More of that in every game, please. Something Shovel Knight does well all throughout is to never break the tone established in the beginning. It's all very nonsensical and a bit ridiculous at times, but since that was the tone the opening promised, it's a good thing that the game doesn't get gritty or overly complex or menial situations. The characters are all as fleshed out as they need to be, and what this game gets away with since it has such a childish aesthetic is to design characters to be over the top. The characters in Shovel Knight are extreme approximation of what real characters should be, which gives it some cartoony elements that realistic games don't get away with. The contrast between serious drama and laughable gameplay isn't an issue in Shovel Knight because the entire thing has a singular vision throughout. That vision carries the player through some of video games' most campy moments in Snake Eater, but like Snake Eater, when the game needs to hit hard, it can hit hard with the best of them. The game's use of tone as a reinforcement for nostalgia is phenomenal. The upbeat music and jolly visuals do a good job of probing the child of memories of experiencing these games, and for many still images of the game, you can feel the tone seep through. But if you think that the tone of the game is its greatest asset for delivering on nostalgia, think again, because the game has another trick up its sleeve. Everyone is an expert on mechanics, but player psychology is too seldom considered in any discussion on the subject, so let's change that. Shovel Knight carefully pilfered pretty much all of its mechanics from other games. Some new, but mostly NES classics. Just to name a few, it took the knockback from Castlevania, the pogo bounce from DuckTales, the Zelda 2 Village and the level selection screen from Super Mario Bros. 3, and perfectly balanced all of them into a coherent game. One whose influences can always be felt, but since there are so many, and since the game never leans too far into the direction of any one of them in particular, it manages to pay homage while never losing its identity. Among the NES mechanics, the game also brought in some newer ones, like the death penalty from the Souls games, the gravity shift from BBBBBB, and the silhouettes level from Super Meat Boy, just to name a few. The great trick of player psychology when bringing all of these different mechanics together is that the game is guaranteed to strike some chord with the player, young or old. 
On the subject of player psychology, how can a game satisfy both the old and new demographics when both have completely different expectations of the game? The answer is in the checkpoint system. You see, the older games often relied on difficulty to substitute their lack of content, but modern games can be finished in an afternoon, so as a compromise, Shovel Knight has checkpoints that make the game a breeze to get through, but the checkpoints themselves can be broken and made unusable should the player want more of a challenge. Breaking the checkpoints also rewards some treasures, so there is a reward in place for the higher difficulty. This way, both the hardcore and the casual player are getting a full experience. Whenever Shovel Knight needs to make concessions for both player bases, it creates a perfect compromise, like how it handles speedrunning. They got speedrunners involved early on, and with rigorous back and forth decided which levels needed tweaking and which should be more difficult. The benefits of getting speedrunners to test the game were mostly little touches, like timing of moving platforms and such, but a big touch is seen in the wandering travelers who spawn randomly on the map. The team saw that when speedrunners were presented with the wandering travelers, they would just load out, then back in, rather than dealing with a randomly spawning enemy. They thought this was a boring way to play, so they set up a rule. If you're beating the game at a certain speed, the wandering encounters don't show up anymore. This is another example of a perfect compromise between demographics, and the pure mark of genius is that most people wouldn't even notice it. To make speedrunning viable in any game, there needs to be release valves that accommodate lower power playthroughs since time spent upgrading is time that could have been spent moving, and luckily Shovel Knight's core mechanics are powerful enough that the game can be completed without any upgrading. An upgrade I really like from a design perspective is the Facing Relic, since it offers timed invulnerability, but its activation freezes the player for a few frames. This means that while optimal for safety, the Facing Relic is detrimental for anyone trying to be quick, so most speedrunners don't use it. Shovel Knight's greatest trick to encourage speedrunning, however, might be the simple addition of a timer. The mere presence of a timer encourages speed. To paraphrase the Phantom Striker, a timer is a reason to speedrun in and of itself. This is a trick of player psychology, and Shovel Knight does a lot of this throughout, but the thing to note from this is that these mechanics could have just as easily destroyed the game, if they hadn't been balanced around a singular goal. I'm bringing this up because we're seeing so many games whose mechanics are balanced around what every other game is doing, instead of what that game should be doing. So now to all, mechanical balancing is what separates the monthly shelf games from the cream of the crop. And also the player's ability to interpret the mechanics, which is done with context and tutorials, and Shadow Knight has the good kind of tutorials. Whenever the player needs to know how to interact with something, they're taught to do so in a safe or optional setting before the dangerous or mandatory one arrives. And the game also has some skillful use of repetition. In the first level alone, the player needs to bounce on dirt blocks, bubbles, enemies, and a dragon miniboss. The context behind the action is different, but the action itself is the same. Every action in the game has more than one context, and that makes the input scheme really powerful from a design perspective because of the sheer amount of possibilities it provides for meaningful player expression. The game uses its mechanic to create a play space balanced around the goal of eliciting in the player a sense of nostalgia, and at least for me it was highly successful. But what kind of story can you tell in that play space? A surprisingly mature one, apparently. In short, there were once adventurers, and among all the heroes, none shone brighter than Shovel Knight and Shield Knight. One day at the Castle of Fate, they were separated, which drove Shovel Knight into a life of solitude. Later, the magic of the Tower of Fate was unsealed, and Shovel Knight decided to Shovel Knight up again against the Enchantress and her minions, the Order of No Quarter. That's the backstory of the game. The actual story in the game is as follows. There are some character interactions, and some revelations made, and it all comes to an end with Shovel Knight and Shield Knight together at a bonfire, reunited at last. Don't get me wrong, it's simple, but it handles its subject material a lot better than most games. The love story is made believable because Shield Knight's absence is felt mechanically. Whenever Shovel Knight dreams of her, there's a lot of treasure on the line, which makes it rewarding to save her. And when we're finally reunited with her, she's immensely useful when it comes to combat, as she pretty much renders all damage to zero and creates useful platforms for the short Shovel Knight. But side scrollers have an unfair advantage when it comes to storytelling, since the realism is abstracted through the more limited axe eye. Whatever narrative is being presented will be more easily absorbed. They do have a harder time touching on the subjects with a realistic tone, but realism as a tone is a heavy limitation anyway, so the gains seem to have set the losses. All in all, the story is great. It establishes that fun adventures were plentiful back in the day, a parallel to our own world, surely, which means that this story itself is actually nostalgic for the era of its progenitors. Meta, huh? But putting aside the raw narrative, the game also has a powerful cast of characters. The cartoony aesthetic of the game means that their characters can be more two-dimensional, but the campy tone of the game means that they can play to the two-dimensionality and create something unique. 
The game makes good use of its limited dialogue, but it's still limited, which means characterization needs to be more nuanced. And what better way to characterize the world than contrast? Shovel Knight himself is the player's lens into the world, and it's through his actions that we contrast and perceive it. He's always shown to be a righteous, regal, chivalrous straight man. When you put him next to, say, the Black Knight or the Polar Knight, you get to play around with their perceptions of each other. Black Knight starts as an antagonist, but by the end is a reluctant comrade. Polar Knight is an old friend who seems to have abandoned his oath. Each fight with the former serves to build anticipation for the Enchantress as he is continually upping his abilities, and the fight with the latter shows us that they clearly learn from the same school of fighting. But where Shovel Knight is nimble and maneuverable, Polar Knight is more focused on controlling the environment and tanking or blocking damage. All three of them seem to have some history, and are linked by their use of the shovel, so purely through design, we would have known that there was history between them even if the game hadn't told us. The other members of the Order of No Quarter also make for some interesting contrast, like Treasure Knight, whose dialogue gives us a clear differentiation of ideologies, as Shovel Knight is generous, but Treasure Knight is greedy. Side note, seems like a waste of potential for the coin not to be somehow a good distraction or something in this fight, mechanics of storytelling and all that anyway, or how the Mole Knight seems somewhat primitive and beastly when compared to Shovel Knight. What makes us like Shovel Knight as a character outside of his interaction with others is his mechanical expression and aesthetical empathy. The first refers to how we feel when expressing ourselves through him, and the latter talks about the psychology of empathy through visuals. Making a game mascot is difficult, no doubt, but if you look at successful mascots, you'll notice a trend of how their mechanical expression is used to display or elicit some emotion. For example, Kratos from the God of War games can only express himself with anger, and Crash Bandicoot can only express himself with insanity. This line of thinking tells us that Shovel Knight feels nostalgic, because all of his mechanical expression is nostalgic. Notice how the modern influences of the game don't touch on Shovel Knight's moveset. It's all environmental or situational, so Shovel Knight himself plays like a relic in a modern game. The aesthetical empathy refers to the art style and how we perceive emotion through it. Shovel Knight has an overall great aesthetic design and really makes good use of its 8-bit graphics. It's actually kind of amazing to see how many different types of levels they managed to pull off with the chosen art style, and yet the games truly deserve to be recognized for it. An interesting thing about 8-bit aesthetics is that they often make the characters chippy. That is to say, give them unproportionately large heads. This is done because the 8-bit graphics don't offer a lot of visual fidelity, and a big part of any audience liking a character is the immediate ability to empathize with that character. And the biggest tool for building empathy is eyes. Large heads give way to large eyes. Sunlight is actually very interestingly designed himself because the player never has the ability to look into his eyes. And because he's always helmeted, he cannot display emotions with his face. Yacht Club games realize this, which is why we have dream sequences and the like to empathize with him through his actions, but a great byproduct of his design is that he never changes expression. This gives the audience a straight man who, much like the Adam West Batman, is fully aware of the ridiculous situation he's in, but never comments on it. That, in my book, is amazing. We project ourselves onto him, but also through him, and both are very pleasant to do, making him very likable. These elements make Shovel Knight feel like a mascot we forgot, as if it was a long-running series only recently rediscovered. If Shovel Knight will be a long-standing series of games, then I think it would benefit from always staying X many generations behind. That way, Shovel Knight 2 might be another NES game with some marginal improvements. Shovel Knight could then bounce into 3D and have a kart racing game before being an open-world exploration-focused game or whatever Yacht Club games decide to do. By staying X generations behind, we ensure that the driving force of this series is always nostalgia, and not simply upping the ante from the last installment. I am very interested in seeing how Shovel Knight would play in 3D and how smooth the integration would be. Super Mario 64 famously had to vindicate the analog stick and did so successfully, but today no one gives much thought into it. It's just there. Shovel Knight 3D would have to pretend that a staple of game design is something new and come up with an interesting balancing act where the 3D camera isn't taken as a given. I'm optimistic that it would be good, because they managed to capture the magic ones, and if this analysis proves anything, it's that it wasn't a fluke that first time. I spoke in my ukulele video on this, but I'm tired of playing the same game over and over again, pretending that the map pack and cutscenes give it an identity. Shadow Knight is a great exploration of nostalgia, because it uses the best tropes of the game it's trying to replicate to create a game that plays like all of them and none of them. Because it grabs ideas from so many games, it is very unlikely that a player playing Shovel Knight wouldn't have experienced one of them in their childhood. So Shovel Knight is almost guaranteed to hit some string with every player. That being said, it is also very approachable on its own. And while most games benefit from being approachable, for Shovel Knight it's even better. 
Since the experienced gamer will feel nostalgic, and the newer gamer will interpret the nostalgia as some kind of weird mythos, where this was how things were, and that feeling of mythos invokes a thirst for context that is never fully quenched since the old games didn't play like this at all. Shovel Knight stands tall among all nostalgia-driven games out there because it broke the rules. It has more music chords than the NES could process, it has a wider aspect ratio, and it would never fit on an NES cartridge. But that's the point. It succeeds as a game about nostalgia, not because it forced on itself the same limitations, but because it feels like how we remember those games. It cherry-picked its design influences and made them into a cohesive experience, and that's Shovel Knight's great lesson to us all going forward. Don't make design decisions based on expectations, make them based on their ability to underline the main emotion of your game. Thanks for watching. In the coming weeks I'm gonna be playing and sharing my thoughts on selected retro games. I chose Shovel Knight to lead into this series because I wanted to discuss nostalgia, retro and antiquated design philosophies without barreling over the selected game and to get around that I chose to discuss a game about those subjects. Or in other words, Shovel Knight was the perfect opening to a series of retro game analyses because it is an introspective on retro games itself and thus discussing it was a discussion on the very meaning of retro. I hope you walk away from this video wiser than you entered and if you want, feel free to leave a like and all that good stuff. You can also find me on Twitter if you want to keep updated on the channel. In the next retro analysis, I will be looking at a title from the PlayStation 1. If you have any suggestions, leave a comment below as I am genuinely interested in your feedback. Until next time.